you so much, Sam. Wow, what a very kind and uh, refreshing introduction. We, we really appreciate it. We are certainly very delighted to be with you and, and share what we call, as you said, coaching better with creativity. And it's certainly our plan to disrupt the views of that are established with most of the people on this call and provide some insights based on creativity science and what we've experienced together with practical applications that certainly drive coaching approaches for athlete impact. Why? Well, you might ask that, and um, I'm going to suggest that you consider three key reasons why coaching better with creativity is worthwhile. The first, creativity in the 21st century is a separator when it comes to leadership. We see this in business, technology, education, and the arts, and if we want to gain an edge in sport, we must explore our creative potential. Secondly, enhancing coaches and leaders' creative potential can support behaviour change, which we all know is hard. It's really tough, and that's the stuff we do day in, day out. Yet it's what we should target as coaches and leaders every day because adopting these best possible behaviours model for ourselves but also those around us. And thirdly, optimising coaches can become our greatest competitive advantage with training methods that differ very little from athlete to athlete and team to team, tactics that are open source and copied from game to game and season to season, culture that's started to become commoditized. Optimizing the coach, their practice and performance is among the biggest opportunities that exist for organization in their quest for ongoing success. So essentially we're linking three of the themes for world class to world best, leadership, coaching and development and performance optimization because we believe they are inextricably linked. And why are these themes linked through creativity? Well, generally, creativity has been identified by organizations around the world as one of the differentiating skills. Not only it is associated with adaptability to changing societies, but it is instrumental for human actualization, self-expression, and even health. And although these are general benefits, Research has shown that some of them also transfer to sport. We all know that the sport environment is more challenging, unpredictable and distracting than ever before. Athletes aspiring to the top level must constantly tinker and reinvent themselves on a regular basis to keep an edge on their competitors. Whether this is to create novel and more functional movement patterns to circumvent constraints like the famous high jump performed by Dick Fosby to win Olympic gold medals or attempting new feats like Simone Biles, or even performing versatile tactical decision-making to win championships in team sports, like game changers such as Sam Kerr, Aaron Phillips, Steve Smith, or even Cameron Munster. And although we mostly perceive, praise, and appreciate creativity for its performance benefits, enhancing creativity in athletes can also reduce their fear of making mistakes, increase their capacity to cope with stress, and enhance cognitive flexibility. So in other words, we're fostering athletes' creativity and their creative potential as a presentation of benefit for both performance and well-being. So, let's dive deep into the field of creative science so we can understand not just at a superficial level because we hear about creativity and the creative process every day on a podcast or in a book or in other places, but let's really hear from an expert who has not only studied it and explored it in multiple domains but applied it with coaches, athletes, and artists. And now that you're a little more familiar with the accent from Montreal, let's get over and do this for So I hope my screen is well shared right now. But if creativity presents such a competitive and well-being advantage, the natural question is how can we enhance creativity in athletes? So it's been almost a decade now that I'm working on that question to develop evidence-based creativity enhancement programs. And although right now the pandemic prevents me from delivering these intervention in person and those on this call that have participated, you know how much I'm passionate about it and how much I miss delivering those interventions. The extra time allowed me to really dive in depth in the creativity science literature to design a conceptual model that presents the element underlying creative potential. Because I thought that if we wanted to enhance something, we must know the component parts. So it is now clear 
that creative action emerge from intricate interaction between an individual characteristics and its environment. As you see on the figure, the environment offer opportunities that the athlete must perceive to act creatively on them. Specifically, an optimal environment should present freedom and risk permissive cultural values combined with trusted relationship as well as stimulated spaces to provide more opportunity for the athlete to explore. To perceive those environmental opportunities use them to act creatively. Of course, the athlete must exhibit skills such as cognitive flexibility, creative confidence, willingness to take risk, tolerance to discomfort, and so on. So basically, each gear act as an enhancer or a limiter on the emergence of creative action. What is listed in those gears right now represent the optimal elements. Of course, not all systems initially present optimal interacting elements. Some gears might be limiting the system from operating optimally because they have been underused and are thus rusty, such as an athlete being close-minded and cognitively rigid because, for instance, he specialized really early in only one sport. And some other gears could also be too strongly anchored and really difficult to shift. This could be exemplified by an environment being governed by an authoritarian figure or culture for a really long time, limiting the creative potential to be fulfilled, although the athlete might present a lot of those characteristics. So well-designed creativity enhancement intervention could potentially oil the system or provide additional energy to mobilize rusty or well-anchored gears, provoking or accelerating the system optimization, leading to the competitive advantage we listed earlier. Um, unfortunately, the problem is that although we now know that creativity is multi-dimensional skill and that the environment is key, most evidence-based intervention use unidimensional approach targeting mainly cognitive skills and ignoring the environment. We thus became super interested in the power of the environment and how we could ensure that sport environments was fulfilling athlete creative potential. Specifically, we wish that all athletes could benefit from what we call a risk-friendly environment. A balance between messy environment full of novel, ambiguous, unpredictable, and spontaneous training activity and a supportive environment where originality is encouraged, mistakes supported, and where it is okay to get worse before you get better if you're trying new skills. So here's our first call for action. In sport, we know that coaches are the key architects responsible for running environments, yet few coaching education programs are equipping coaches with the skills required to coach for creativity or the strategies to design creativity supportive environments to instill that creativity in others. So as organisations, we should be thinking differently, and this is for performance directors, general managers, CEOs and boards to understand better the work that coaches do and that coaches need support and expertise around them to optimise their practice and performance. No different to athletes, we want to see them improving, growing, learning and staying in front of the curve, not following it. And we know that in most cases, these coaches are beyond that traditional coach education and development structure, so they could be isolated and largely left to fend for themselves. What we would like to do and should be providing are opportunities and stimulus that encourage and support this quest to be the best if we truly believe in optimising the coach as a competitive advantage. So, to help coaches design these risk-friendly environments that Sam introduced and Vero's talked a little bit about, that balance high challenge, that messy environment, high support, and to coach for creativity, our approach must be different. So, Vero and I started to push these boundaries and explore how we could transform the coach with experiential learning in creative environments. 
for us, it became clear that if creativity is facilitated by the environment and that coaches are responsible for the design of this environment, coaches were the roots for lasting creative growth in athlete. If we could better equip coaches with strategy to coach for creativity, I mean, that would be a good start. But if we could make them more creative, that would be even better. And the challenge is that it's a widely accepted view from numerous studies, reviews and reports in sport that coaches are not open enough to outside views and that traditional coaching could be holding back the performance progress of many sports. Think technique as an example and how we deal with that in our respective environments. We still see a lot of linear, prescriptive and authoritarian environments in sport, which we know limits that creativity. So making coaches more creative and equipping them with the tools to coach for creativity was not going to be solved with traditional methods, because if it was, then we would have already done that. So as we mentioned earlier, changing behavior is really hard, really, really tough and difficult. Our intention is to provoke this change in coaches, first by embracing discomfort and the unknown, then allowing themselves to be inspired so they can model these behaviors as leaders and influence the broader environments they're involved in. So when Vero suggested to me to take a radical approach using movement activities as a way to ignite a full day of creative development for coaches at Cirque du Soleil, I got curious and then we went all in. Unfortunately, because we're in a pandemic and we're all virtual today, we won't be doing this together and having that opportunity as we would much prefer. But if we were, this is what it might look like. Play video. activity. 
activities, and af after spending enough time in circus and seeing all these artists grow effectively, cognitively, socially from various type of movement activity, I had my own aha moment. Why not designing movement activity to initiate the development of element underpinning creative potential and provoke creative learnings? What you saw on the video that we like to call movement improvisation was born. So to really understand the purpose behind these activity, I'm going to share my screen again and uh, we'll go back to the model that I presented earlier. The first principle that guide these activities is disruption. I know it might sound contradictory that to enhance creative potential, you must disrupt your system. Yet, disrupt, disrupting coaches' thoughts, emotions, social interaction through movement improv is what allow coaches to move away from their well-anchored pattern. And what I, what I mean by that well, let's take, for instance, the first activity you saw on the video, which I call walking away from the obvious. Most of us walk every day, and I'm sure most of us have never reconsidered the way we walk. And I know that might be an extreme example, but we do this with so many behaviors and beliefs. We develop a pattern. And then we just stick to it without even reconsidering whether it is the optimal one. In the activity walking away from the obvious, I ask coaches to explore various ways to walk by walking like if their body was made of different substances. This constraint that I impose plus environmental condition that we set lead coaches toward a state of disequilibrium. And because most human, uh, at, at the start, actually, sorry about that, they are, clear, they are clearly uncomfortable. They look at each other, they don't really know what to do. And because, because most human dislike being in such a state of instability, coaches naturally start exploring various effective, cognitive, and social strategies to reorganize and regain stability. By walking like if they were made of ice, sparkling water, air, or oil, coaches must open their mind to new possibilities, be willing to take risks, be cognitively flexible, and show some vulnerability by expressing their silliness. But the activity itself is not enough. The second principle that underlies movement improv is awareness. Therefore, each movement activities is followed by a debrief that encourages coaches to reflect and share on their experience. I ask them what they have noticed in terms of movement and physical sensation, any specific thoughts that came to mind during the activity. Um, I walk them through their emotional experience and how they navigated the activity to Together when the activity involve, involve more uh, social connection. So, uh, Darren, you've heard so many of these debriefs. Any common trend or things that are said often? Yeah, this is always a real highlight for me, given that we hear the same things from coaches from so many different backgrounds, and they realize that they limit themselves because they think they can't move that way. Or they can't be good at the task because they're used to being good at things that they do. And most of all, it's really uncomfortable. However, once they let go of those expectations and say, ah, I became free to play with the activities and start to, you know, let things flow. By starting with this movement improv, coaches become a little more open to new ideas. They start to ask some more questions and the possibilities when we start talking about what this might look like in their environments and how it can help to inspire next practice. Sure, there's still a bit of uncertainty and skepticism, yet we've unlocked and opened the door to a future of creative opportunities. In fact, using movement as an igniter allowed us to shake the entire system and help coaches 
feel and experience what it means to do things differently. What it takes to become more creative can't only be understood intellectually. It has to be experienced. It is from experiencing this equilibrium that you start opening, opening your perception to different opportunities, potentially increasing the likelihood of creative action, which can also lead to some general learning, uh, creative learning as it appear right now on your screen. So what comes next? This might put some fuel in the tank, provoke some thoughts and possibilities and create even further questions. As we suggested, it ignites or it lights the fire with the coaches. So now that we have their attention and eagerness to understand what happened during this process of movement improv, it's important that we capitalize on the momentum of this session and build upon those foundations with further cognitive construct and applied strategies to coach for creativity. This lead us to our third principles, transferability. Each movement improv is designed around a creative learning outcome that we then transfer in the classroom to help coaches design their next practice or solve long lasting problems. So from walking away from the obvious in the gym, we learn cognitive strategies to circumvent well anchored coaching pattern in the classroom. So zoom in, zoom out, upside down thinking are only a few examples of strategies to walk away from the obvious. Therefore, coaches not only experience what it feels like to disrupt their patterns, they also learn strategies to challenge themselves in their daily coaching environment. For the rest of the day at Cirque du Soleil, coaches are thus invited to bring their unresolved problem to the table and through reflective, experiential and formative activities, we equip them with strategies to find innovative solution. Problem redefinition, collective ideation, incremental thinking activities, we walk them through the entire creative process. And what about instilling creativity in athletes? Well, we don't have time now to describe this in detail, but of course, once we have initiated the creative motivation and confidence in coaches, we share with them various strategies to coach for creativity and instill creativity in athletes. So it's obvious, right? We're not gonna ship the whole Australian sports system to Las Vegas for a day with Cirque du Soleil. And we might say, well, that was a fun day and a huge privilege to spend a day in that environment. But now what? What are we gonna do about it? Well, all the coaches upon reflection, certainly in the most recent visit to that Cirque du Soleil environment, and even before the day had come to a close, begin to realize the impact upon them personally, their mindset, their connection to a group, their freedom of thought, and ultimately their commitment to provide this experience to a wider audience of staff and athletes. And the questions were asked of me whether or not it was realistic to recreate elements of this day in Las Vegas in Australia. So a result being that we were able to bring Veronique to Australia for a creativity tour in January of 2020 for a period of around three weeks. So although the day at Cirque du Soleil is a great start, we're well aware it's far from being enough. And the coaches that really become creative follow are those that are integrating some of these strategies into their daily practice and life and we'll share a few short examples of that now the first being one of leadership influence I know some of these people are listening to the call right now and don't want to and I do want to recognize that they had some courage to show belief in the approach and be strong advocates for change in the way that coaches design their environments the learning in Vegas gave them a, this group of coaches the willingness to take some huge risks and bring to Australia the methods to share with their senior leaders in that sport along with a broader group of coaches.
You oh. can go in amongst all the bruises. I'll go on this side of the head more. At national performance level and state level, and then take it further to their athletes. Collect collectively in the space of a little over 12 months, and even during a pandemic, this has led to a systematic shift to enhance that daily training environment by preserving. We're not saying don't do the things you've always done, preserving what's important and also adding creative elements which expose athletes to a range of different challenges and mental engagement. So once in a while, I receive videos from these coaches showing me cognitively engaging warm-up providing athlete with the possibility of creating their own variation of movement or even better innovative ways to do endurance work where athletes actually are not looking bored. And sometimes an email pop up asking me for new ideas to encourage athletes to step out of their comfort zone. In any case, this shows that the creative enhancement training impacts positively the coach's motivation and confidence to coach for creativity. In fact, to highlight a very specific uh, transfer on an athlete of this style of coaching. During my visit to Australia last year, I had the chance to work more closely with an athlete coach by this group of willing coaches. Because they became enough open-minded to expose their elite athletes to movement improvisation, one athlete realizes the impact of various emotion on her overall state of performance. I haven't talked uh, about it yet, and it was not part of the short clip we presented to you, but one movement activity is about moving with emotion. Not only we do this activity in the gym with emotionally driven music, but we also transfer the concept to sports specific training activity. Following this experimentation, the athlete realizes that every time she was performing with love, she was feeling really good. Yet, she had never thought of integrating, even less triggering, that loving emotion before a performance. That led to a conversation on various ways she could connect to that feeling in her pre-performance routine in competition. Again, a lot of elite athletes have rigid patterns that prevent them from exploring other strategies that could support their performance even better. In this case, the disruption caused by movement improv opened the door to many more opportunities for this athlete to be fully ready to perform. And our final example is one with a performance support team that all of you will be very familiar. It was a really pleasing and somewhat unexpected additional outcome as we used the collective and incremental ideation strategies to help this team pre-solve a range of complex multi-dimensional problems pertaining to an athlete's preparation a few months out and leading into the Tokyo Olympics. This individual athlete's head coach decided to take a different approach and instead of having a what we would call a traditional case management meeting, we took the opportunity following the movement improv session to apply creative principles to a pre-mortem workshop where we played with a whole range of creative methods to free up everyone's ideas without any judgment. And by the end of this meeting, not only were numerous solutions identified for possible problems we might encounter, the group was energized, aligned, and felt like they were actually future-proofing the preparation into the games. So I think it is time to wrap this up and to do so, let's connect back to the start and kind of uh, bring back the three reasons why we should coach and lead better with creativity. So first of all, have we seen more creative creativity in leadership? A resounding yes. Certainly in those sports, we've observed a deeper appreciation and understanding of creativity and what it's all about not just at that superficial level, right? It's not a one-off. It must become a part of an accepted way that we do business. And with continued support, it will be possible to grow the level of confidence and competence in our coaches and as decision makers embrace 
this change, embracing this change, they will assist their respective organisations to be very well positioned to deliver world best environments and achieve performance. Have we noticed changes in behaviours? Definite yes. Even if I'm at the other side of the planet, receiving these videos from various coaches is showing me that we instill willingness to take risk, tolerance to discomfort, vulnerability, and much more, which are all elements that support coaches' creative growth. Optimizing the coach, our next frontier. This can be our competitive advantage, but it still has a way to go. But I think the opportunity is real and it's now. We've presented today is just one way to help people be more comfortable with the discomfort of designing creative practice. Our ultimate goal is to develop more methods which actually help people be uncomfortable being comfortable on the search for better, which is a real trait of all those coaches we know around the globe who are truly world's best that I'm sure Neil and Eddie will pick up on this again tomorrow. So where are we at? Sport is currently facing the challenge of optimizing performance as well as well-being in athletes. If you've paid close attention to the model I presented today, there are clear parallels in optimizing creative potential and promoting well-being. That the same elements which nurture creativity also promote well-being more generally. We want athletes to be tolerant to discomfort, open, flexible, and confident. Yet, creative growth won't happen and performance and well-being won't be fully optimized unless we are willing to take the risk of reimagining how we design sport environments. Every time we did the creative enhancement training at Cirque du Soleil, the coaches that attended were already world-class, most of them coaching the best athletes in the world in their respective sport. But I believe that being challenged to optimize their creative potential and being thought strategy to coach for creativity give them a push towards becoming world best. The question now is, when will you be willing to take that step? embracing and developing your creative potential as coaches and leaders to offer all athletes the best possible environment to thrive. Our invitation today, let's all coach and lead better with creativity. Merci. Veronique and Darren, thank you so much for that. I've, I have a, a two pages full of notes actually and uh, I that people who are watching will too. I also feel really inspired. I feel energised uh, by listening to you both, by watching that video and taking us into a world. Uh, personally, just a quick reflection. I'm hearing a lot and reading a lot with interest about athletes who are dancing literally with the lights off before they hit uh, their contact sports on football fields. Uh, I have not heard about this kind of method around coaching and it makes perfect sense if the coaches are leading these teams um, why aren't they dancing in the dark as well and I hate to kind of really summarize it in a snappy way but um, your smiles are kind of giving me the feeling that that's not such a bad question to be asking at this point thank you both uh, for joining us here on Sydney time um, particularly to you Dr Veronique um, in Montreal we wish you the very best we'll follow this movement with great interest and we really appreciate the challenge that you laid at the sector today and Darren I'll just recall one really key line that you said to us optimizing coaches can be our competitive advantage now if anyone's saying we should not be exploring that uh, they're not thinking hard enough about competitive advantage so thank you so much all the very best of luck in your pursuits and making the world a more creative uh, place and a happy place at that as well we will be back